Disruptive session, it's all about what really makes uh, a change in energy. And uh, today, we start our disruptive session with a very tiny element, the tiniest element in universe, but it will make a huge disruption to the energy world. At least if you believe policymakers and energy business people all over Europe. I'm, of course, talking about hydrogen and Europe's journey towards a hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is the expected game-changer on our way to a green economy. And I'm really super proud today to welcome three very distinguished spe impulse speakers from politics, from industry, about this topic, two of which will also join us later on in the discussion on the panel. And uh, I will introduce everyone directly uh, before uh, his or her speech. And I would like to start with Mr. Andreas Feicht. Andreas, welcome. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great. Andreas, in Germany, I hardly need to introduce you because you are well known in the whole ecosystem. You are an economist. And you started on an entrepreneurial career in a self-funded consulting firm. You were CEO of one of the large municipal utilities in Germany, the Stadtwerke Wuppertal, and you served there for many, many years. You used to be the vice president of the WKU. This is the Association of Municipal Utilities in Germany. And since the beginning of 2019, you are Secretary of State for Energy and Digital in the German Federal Ministry of Economics. And we are really excited to have you here. So again, a warm welcome, and we are really looking forward uh, to hearing your point of view to hydrogen. Andreas, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much um, for this warm welcome, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, this is just a good timing you, uh, you, cho uh, you have chosen because um, uh, we are now, um, as Germany and the German government, um, uh, in the duty of the EU presidency. And I'm just uh, coming from the informal energy ministerial. And we discussed uh, one specific topic, which leads us um, to hydrogen. This is the question of greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. That, that will be the objective of the European Commission that also comes along with um, higher targets uh, when it comes to greenhouse gases um, by 2030. But we have to understand that uh, greenhouse gas neutrality means uh, total game changer. So to shift all uh, CO2 emissions out of the system uh, by avoiding those uh, emissions or by storing those emissions is a totally other approach to how we consume, how we travel, how we produce uh, in Europe. So just to give you two, two brief numbers, we in Germany, we shifted out 400 million, Euro, uh, 400 million tons of uh, CO2 emissions between 1990 and today. And, but we have to shift out another 800 million tons of CO2 until 2050, so in only 30 years of time. That means that we have to make giant of efforts on uh, these uh, very ambitious goals. Um, and if you look uh, one, a little bit deeper to what it, that, uh, what it means for the energy markets and for the energy system, there are two main pillars, as, at least for Germany. One is we have to um, engage and engage uh, uh, more on renewables and to rely more on uh, renewables. So the expanding of the renewable system and the capacities must be uh, gone on quite quickly. And that means that the integration of renewables into the system, be it uh, by expanding the grids or be it by more, uh, at least uh, smart and digital solutions, is key from, from my perspective. And the second is, of course, hydrogen, because uh, we in Germany, we said that nuclear options are not a part of our solution scheme. So that, that might be looked at a little bit differently in other European countries or worldwide. But for us in Germany, uh, nuclear is not an option anymore. And that means that we have to rely um, on natural gas as long as we have to decarbonize this gas. 
because uh, we are shifting out of and phasing out of coal, hard coal and lignite, and we are phasing out of nuclear, as I mentioned. But we have to deliver 2,500 uh, terawatt hours of primary energy consumption to the whole um, economy in Germany, to the whole society. And uh, we can't do it only by electrifying the whole uh, system. So uh, besides the vast um, expansion of renewables, we need hydrogen. So hydrogen is one of the key elements in order to uh, reach these very amb ambitious goals of uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. And hydrogen, of course, should be produced uh, also out of renewables, uh, and it should be, um, be green hydrogen, so out of uh, renewable electricity. But it's obvious that it can't be done by, uh, by uh, our own in Germany all alone. We have to collaborate with other European countries, so it must be a European approach uh, to uh, establishing a hydrogen um, economy, but also globally spoken. So um, hydrogen is just another way um, of carrying renewable electricity to our market. So it's, a, it's not an energy source, but it's an energy carrier. And it's very important to uh, understand. But hydrogen and uh, establishing a hydrogen economy uh, is not only a push effect, not only like, like we did it um, um, uh, previously on the renewable side in the electricity market. It's not only to produce or to source or to import hydrogen, it's also a pull effect. So um, it is very important to have the demand inside, the off-taking side. That's why our hydrogen strategy, which we launched by, uh, in, in, in summer this year, um, has these uh, three dimensions uh, one is producing hydrogen and sourcing hydrogen by imports. One is the off-taking part. Um, so mobility, industry, all those uh, sectors who can't be electrifying cost efficiently or technically. Um, and as a missing link, if you will, the infrastructure. So infrastructure is absolutely key when it comes to establishing a hydrogen uh, strategy. And that's why regulation is important. That's what we discussed with our European partners and the European Commission. So we need a regulation scheme for a hydrogen um, uh, infrastructure. And it, of course, we have to do it in a cost-efficient uh, way. So we should use the infrastructure we already have. Uh, we suffer a little bit uh, the problems we have on the electricity side in exp because we have to expand our electricity grid, uh, obviously, because we have to um, replace, as I mentioned, coal and nuclear by offshore wind, onshore wind, and uh, photovoltaics that um, uh, needs more electricity grid. But we can't do that another time on the hydrogen side. So we should use um, the infrastructure we have. And this is, of course, the natural gas infrastructure, the pipelines we already financed and which are, is already, already there. And of course, there's also in some cases in, in Germany, especially in Northern Westphalia, there's also a privately owned uh, hydrogen network uh, actual in uh, place. So from my point of view, um, this is what uh, politics uh, will move for the, not only the next uh, couple of months and years, but for the next decades. And this is, a, as I mentioned already, a huge game changer. And from my point of view, those technologies and those companies who can contribute uh, contribute to these uh, objectives, especially understanding the demand, not only the, uh, the push effect, not only the supply, but also the demand side, understanding the customer's needs and being near to the customers, those companies will be very successful and um, we will be happy to work with these stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, that was very inspiring and insightful, especially for uh, industrial managers. And uh, it's always uh, very, let's say, um, uh, exciting if we see that politics is uh, paving the way and paving, paving the path for industry partly to follow. Um, one question uh, I would like uh, to ask to you is um, 
the question of the origin of hydrogen. So in your point of view, uh, which role does, uh, let's say, international um, uh, contracts and co uh, international import schemes on hydrogen play for those visions? Well, as I, as I mentioned, um, we want to see uh, uh, carbon neutral hydrogen. So, um, in, uh, in the long run, we rely on green hydrogen. So, hydrogen which is produced out of renewable electricity. But of course, uh, the ramp up of those scales uh, we need because of cost efficiency and also the, uh, the amount of hydrogen is not easy to, to reach. Um, what we do is um, we are relying on your uh, on, on European cooperation and collaboration. Let's see, like uh, 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 for example, um, offshore wind uh, innovation and invest, uh, investments um, in the North Sea. We just signed um, uh, cooperation between the Baltic states in Stettin uh, just last week uh, in order to establish also an offshore wind. Uh, industry on the, in the Baltics, but we will also establish, and we are, are under, uh, already doing that uh, on a global level with countries like Saudi Arabia, like Chile. Uh, we are talking to uh, Canada and to all do those countries who are able uh, to uh, contribute a lot of uh, renewable energies in order to um, produce hydrogen quite cost efficiently in big amounts. But to be very clear, from my point of view, we also will have uh, the need to accept also hydrogen, uh, which comes out of natural gas, but with a CCS process. So uh, that is what Norway is uh, uh, elaborating on, and also the Netherlands, um, because the industry, so the off-taker side, like steel, like the chemistry industry and all, all the others, they want to um, invest into the assets in order to be able to use this hydrogen when they are uh, when when they know and when they are uh, confident that they get uh, uh, this hydrogen in uh, in an amount they they need and to affordable prices. So this is what will be established. And at the end of the day, uh, any hydrogen source must be competitive, and. Uh, <clears throat> We will see a, a market like we have it today in a gas market, so quite transparent and um, so that everybody can rely also on transparency into these markets. But of course, uh, with certification so that there, there is trust where the hydrogen is coming from, from and that is clear that it is carbon neutral. Thank you very much, Andreas, for your inspiring talk. I think we could talk for hours, but uh, we know that you are tight in time. Thank you very much for joining us. You know you joined us on short notice. We highly appreciate that. Thank you very much. And it's a pity that you cannot join us on our panel. And um, that's uh, the downside of a virtual uh, event, that you cannot hear the applause, which is uh, certainly now roaring through the Internet. So thank you very much. Back to Berlin. And that Thank leads you. me to our next speaker, uh, also uh, someone who is really, really an in-depth uh, expert, uh, Mr. Klaus Bonhoff. Do we have him, have him online already? Hello, Klaus. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing very fine. Thank you very much. Great. Um, Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you here. I uh, will do a very brief uh, presentation. I know that you hold a degree on mechanical engineering from Aachen, from a uh, well-known uh, and well-established uh, RWTH Aachen. Uh, you were a manager in the automotive industry at Daimler, uh, and you took over as a managing director at NOW GmbH, the national organization at, uh, uh, of hydrogen and fuel cell technology, some 12 years ago. From this position, you moved from this position at the interface of politics, industry and science, you, uh, you took over a position in the Ministry of Transportation and Digitization and you are leading the Department of General Affairs. And we are now super excited to hear about your point of view, maybe with a little color of uh, uh, what may be the use of hydrogen in the transportation field, I guess. So, Klaus, the stage is yours. 
Yes, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, obviously, I will talk about hydrogen fuel cells and transportation, uh, but not only. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't uh, able to hear what State Secretary Feicht was uh, talking about. So there may be some uh, repeating of messages since uh, I do intend to talk about the national hydrogen strategy that we collectively within the government uh, have decided some weeks ago. Um, since we are always very well aligned within the government, uh, I don't fear that my messages will be contradictory to what uh, Mr. Feich was saying. Um, just bear with me if there is uh, some duplication. Um, and I'll be talking about hydrogen. We're not uh, talking about hydrogen just now. Uh, hydrogen obviously has a long history. Uh, it has been a commodity in the chemical industry for, for over 100 years, but also hydrogen as a fuel and hydrogen as an energy carrier, uh, specifically in fuel cell applications, is not really new. So we're not starting from scratch. And based on the research and development that we have done over the last uh, more than 10 years, more than 20 years almost, uh, we are today at a point where we can say uh, that we have technology at hand with which we can start commercialization. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, 20 years ago, we had already something uh, like a hype on hydrogen and we were hoping that we could get hydrogen into the market uh, very much faster than we then saw it. Um, and we need to make sure that today we have a very positive dynamic that we don't have a hype uh, with over expectations, but that we manage the transition towards utilization of hydrogen in various uh, industries. And, and this is really one of the game changers that we, today we're talking about the role of hydrogen in an energy system that in the end will have to be based on renewable energies. So we are obviously addressing climate change topics uh, with using hydrogen. At the same time, we are addressing hydrogen from a more industry political point of view. Uh, speaking about Germany, speaking about Europe, we have to maintain our jobs uh, in the energy sector and also in the automotive industry and uh, hydrogen and fuel cell technologies clearly are technologies where um, this uh, will be very favorable for, for the industry as a whole, uh, looking at the whole value chain that is associated with this. So it's against this background, uh, climate change and decarbonization on one side, industry politics on the other side, that the German government came up with the national hydrogen strategy. Um, and if you want to, it's a clear statement that to, tomorrow's energy world will not only be based on electrons, but that molecules will have to play a role as well. Uh, and obviously these molecules will have to be based on renewable energies. Uh, the other very important message of the national hydrogen strategy is that we have to see hydrogen not as a national topic, not as a, as a European topic, but as a global topic. So besides the fact that we want to develop a domestic market, we clearly look at uh, what is Europe doing and we're clearly looking at international cooperations. So in more detail, uh, the national hydrogen strategy is really targeting to um, make hydrogen competitive. In order to become more competitive, uh, obviously costs will have to come down. Uh, this is associated to the current CO2 regime that we do have. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have the right regulatory framework. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we scale technology to uh, larger production volumes, to larger application volumes. Uh, so this is really what we're trying to support with the national hydrogen strategy from various angles with different ministries being involved. I mentioned the domestic home market that we want to create, five gigawatt of electrolyzer technology and capacity is the target for 2030. Uh, talking about transportation, and this figure is not very well known, if we look at the anticipated hydrogen volumes in transportation, uh, easily we would claim uh, around about one third of that capacity to be needed for the transportation sector. So besides the industry applications, uh, we need to make sure that we also get the uh, mobility and transportation applications into the market. And really one of the beauties of this strategy is that we kind of uh, summarize all the demand on the production side so we can scale on the electrolyzer side. And at the same time, we um, have the various applications that we are addressing in parallel. 
Well, looking at the overall volumes that will be needed in terms of hydrogen, uh, it does become obvious that we don't have domestically sufficient renewable energies to produce all this hydrogen. So we will have to um, import hydrogen. We will have to work on European partnerships. We will have to work on global partnerships. And I'm fully convinced that we will see sooner or later a global trading of hydrogen molecules. Uh, from our perspective, we would support the green hydrogen mo molecules, but we are obviously aware of the fact that different colors of hydrogen will play in the global picture as well. Uh, in terms of mobility, we need to establish hydrogen as an energy carrier, talking about hydrogen as a fuel for fuel cell vehicles, uh, and in, in parallel to that, using hydrogen to derive synthetic fuels out of this hydrogen together with the carbon base. So we need synthetic fuels to also support our climate change targets in the transportation sector. So be very clear, looking at our 2030 transportation targets, battery electric vehicles, fuel cell electric vehicles powered with hydrogen and synthetic fuels will have to be brought to market in parallel. We cannot wait until we get the first one done and then start with the second one. We really need to make sure that we take this in a parallel approach. We obviously then also need hydrogen to decarbonize the industry sector. Um, I will not go into those details, um, but let me be very clear that with this national hydrogen strategy, we do address the complete value chain from production via distribution and infrastructure all the way to the application. Now, in terms of infrastructure, um, this might be interesting, of course, for this audience. Um, there is obviously a discussion needed whether or not and to what extent we can utilize existing gas pipelines where we may need dedicated hydrogen pipelines. Um, here it is worthwhile looking at other European countries, especially I'm thinking about the Netherlands, where we see a lot of dynamics towards transforming a natural gas-based grid towards a hydrogen-based uh, grid. So um, this is actually one of the key uh, energy political topics I guess we need to address, which will then pay uh, also into using hydrogen in the transportation sector. Um, this is all embedded into what is being discussed in the context of the Green Deal on a European context. Uh, in Germany, we have uh, had now the opportunity with our recovery program to add a substantial amount of funding to the national hydrogen strategy, uh, 9 billion euros overall, 7 billion uh, to develop domestic technologies and markets, and 2 billion to address uh, European and global um, cooperations. Uh, and then in the end, uh, we have very concrete measures in our national hydrogen strategy to implement uh, what I've just mentioned. Obviously, we also have a governance structure. We are very happy that uh, Katharina Reiche is uh, chairing our Hydrogen Council, which was established uh, as an independent body to really support the government to implement the national hydrogen strategy. And it can only be done jointly with industry, academia and government uh, to get us to where we need to be. Now, the main measures do address uh, production, industry, mobility, the heat sector, international cooperation, uh, distribution and infrastructure and research and development. And uh, allow me to speak about uh, some mobility, uh, more specific topics. Um, on the regulatory framework side, we do need an ambitious implementation of the Renewable Energy Directive uh, to become a little bit politic here political here, um, what we now see from our colleagues, from the Ministry of Environment, uh, from our perspective is not ambitious enough. So this will continue to be a very um, intense discussion within the government, but also with this, the stakeholders to make sure that uh, we use the uh, Renewable Energy Directive as a tool to really motivate alternative fuels, not only uh, using power in battery electric vehicles, but also to use hydrogen and uh, synthetic fuels in the transportation sector. We will continue our national innovation program on hydrogen and fuel cell technologies, which has proven to be a very effective and uh, well-coordinated program, which covers research and development, as well as CAPEX funding. Um, we're specifically looking, of, of course, from a transportation point of view at building up infrastructure 
We have come to a level where we have 100 hydrogen refueling stations for passenger cars, fuel cell vehicle passenger cars in Germany. H2.life is the website that you may want to check out to see how well these 100 sites are distributed uh, among Germany. But obviously those discussions will continue towards heavy duty trucking uh, and infrastructures for non-road applications, which also are an important part of the picture uh, in rail, in water, in ships, in uh, aviation is where we are also uh, seeing activities to develop respective uh, vehicles. The Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive will be revised starting next year. So this is where we need to make sure that hydrogen will also be uh, well addressed. And uh, we strategically do address in our program the supply industry, especially on the automotive uh, industry side, automotive standing for the mobility uh, industry as a whole, if you want to. It's not only automotive, but it is really the whole value chain uh, stack production, hydrogen storage, the complete system, uh, integration into various types of vehicles. So this is where we want to come up with specific uh, activities and funding opportunities for, for the supply industry. And uh, last but not least, regulation codes and standards is an important pillar also to be addressed. Um, if we look at the international activities on specifically fuel cell vehicles uh, in Asia, in Japan, in Korea, and uh, in, in China. Uh, we see a lot of dynamic there. So we need to make sure that we stay competitive in that field as well. And the National Hydrogen Strategy um, is our framework to support our industry and to reach our climate targets. So hydrogen is linking the energy sectors and mobility clearly is one part of the mobility of the energy sector. Um, it's uh, not only for transportation, but uh, also for, for transportation, an important pillar to reach our climate change targets. And we need to make sure that we see this not only as a national, not only as a European activity, but really as a global activity that is ahead of us. So we are supporting uh, beyond our national uh, programs, uh, the EU activities in this field. And we do want to come up with international partnerships to make sure that green molecules will help us to decarbonize our energy sectors in Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus, for your very insightful and comprehensive talk and sharing your strategic thoughts. What stuck with me is um, uh, the strong emphasis that you gave on the topic of market when uh, all of this uh, hydrogen story needs to come in place. You stay with us. You will join us uh, later on for our talk and uh, you uh, keep yourself available for some questions, that's great. And now I would like to introduce our last speaker in this row um, and I would like to welcome my dear new colleague Katharina Reiche. Uh, Katharina took over uh, the position as chairwoman of E.ON's largest daughter company, um, West Energy AG, quite recently. Uh, and if I think about uh, all uh, the functions uh, that you had in your past uh, for, the, for your party, for the state, on science, on society, it would cover an own 15-minute slot. So um, I would like uh, to concentrate on the most important one. So you were a member of the German Bundestag for 17 years. Um, you uh, served as Parliamentary Secretary of State from 2013 onwards. And you took over the chair of the Association of Municipal Utilities uh, in 2015 until you joined us uh, to our great pleasure. And uh, we would now be really, really curious to uh, hear about the industrial point of view on hydrogen. Katharina, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, dear Klaus. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here today at the Energy Innovation Days of E.ON. A lot of interesting ideas has been already presented today and has been uh, discussed. They showed once more the rapid change our industry is undergoing. This rapid change is further accelerated by the current crisis. Actually, we have a triple crisis. A climate crisis, a corona pandemic crisis, and an economic crisis. 
and all associated with each other. Neither one of these crises can be solved by solving the other two at the same times. And that's really a hyper-complexity we had never seen before. And it's a challenge, a new dimension, but also tremendous opportunity, especially for us in the energy sector. If we want to come out of this crisis stronger in the long term, we must make our economy and most of all our industry carbon neutral. This is not just about solving a climate crisis. It's quite simply about the question of whether we will continue to have a globally competitive industry, to have a prospering economy, prosperity and growth in our country. The world is not waiting for us. The race towards climate neutral production has long since begun. Look at Asia, look at America. And Germany and Europe are no longer pioneers in this field, but only co-leaders. And it's not clear who will make the race in the end of the day. What we need right now, it's not only a change in mind, it's a concrete action. I've two children and they ask me often, what do you do and what does Eon does your new company to combat climate change? And as they grow older, the questions are getting tougher. The discussion has now finally reached the middle of society. We have to find answers to many and varied demands society, politics, consumers, customers, made on us. And to achieve the common climate goals, there is one central answer, it's hydrogen. The energy turnaround or the energy vendor of an economy as Germany can only be succeed through the use of hydrogen why is it considered to be so important? We want, no, we must reach climate neutrality. We have to decarbonize our system. To achieve this, we have massively expanding electricity generation through wind power or solar power, but not all applications can be easily electrified. Hydrogen is an energy carrier and will therefore become indispensable for all applications which are not can use green electricity for technical reasons, for chemical reasons or for economical reasons when it's not possible or not reasonable. For this we need to link up the various sector of energy consumption. Electrolysis is the central process and hydrogen is here the link between the electric world and the material world. Another advantage is that hydrogen offers a possibility of storing green electricity and using the energy when it's needed. The energy of the future, the energy system of the future, is characterized by a volatile feed-in and seasonal consumption. The seasonal differences in the heating sector are obviously. We have low demands in summer, we have high demands in winter, and it must be balanced somehow. In the long term, therefore, we will need large capacity and long-term storage facilities to implement the energy vendor. The available Storage technology differs significantly in terms of available capacity or storage times. Batteries will not be able to provide the necessary storage capacity. Then we have pumped storage power plants. They will make an important contribution. Nevertheless, there are geographical limitations and limitations because of massive interventions into nature. Only material storage units have the necessary storage capacity and currently hydrogen 
is the technology which offers us the possibility of storing renewable electricity in existing gas storing facilities. With an appropriate infrastructure, we can convert renewable electricity into gas and use it in other sectors or use it later. Hydrogen, if I may say so, is a battery of the future. In Germany, we have already a very well-developed gas network and infrastructure. The gas network in Germany consists of 547,000 kilometers of transmission grid and distribution gas grids. The transmission grid alone transports about three times as much energy and four times as much capacity than the complete German electric grid. In addition, the German gas infrastructure comprises 47 underground storage facilities with a capacity of 240 terawatt hours. This corresponds to around a quarter of the natural gas volume what Germany needs per year. The German gas industry has the largest storage volume in the European Union. This development offers great opportunities for us as gas net operator, as gas DSO. We must now prove that we are capable of carrying out this transformation. The founding of the National Hydrogen Council is essential for the success. The Council advises and supports the government. Klaus has already talked about it. We write proposals, we write recommendations for actions for the implementation and for the development of the National Hydrogen Strategy. I'm proud to be part of this body and I have the honor to chair it. Together we want to identify solutions how to hydrogen can contribute to climate neutrality in the industry sector, mobility sector, in the heating sector or in the energy sector. The common goal of the Hydrogen Council is to make Germany to world leader in hydrogen technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, in Germany, the consumption of hydrogen, which is mainly not yet produced from green sources, is currently around 55 terawatt hours. The demand is expected to be doubled by 2030. The increase is predicted to come from mobility, from steel or from chemistry. And it's just a small part what we need really for gas in industry. In 2019, the total consumption was about 363 terawatt hour of natural gas. Steel production is one of the most CO2 intensive industries in Germany. In order to switch production to hydrogen-based technology, a hydrogen demand of 38 up to 65 terawatt hours are expected by 2050. And even if it should be possible to install all electro reserves capacity targeted by the federal government by 2030, about 5 gigawatt, it's likely that there's a very large gap between supply and demand. So firstly, we need strong incentives to ensure that the generation plants needed in this country are actually built. This includes, for example, exempting electro reserves, PTX plants, from levies such as the Renewable Resource Act and the surcharges. Secondly, we need a reliable framework for hydrogen networks and a broad social and political consensus. A first important step toward the establishment of a hydrogen economy is the inclusion of hydrogen into the legal framework. The current gas definition does not recognize hydrogen fed into pure hydrogen networks. That must be changed urgently. The transport and storage of hydrogen, regardless how it is produced, must be allowed. In the short term, the current regulatory regime should be applied to both pure hydrogen networks and to feed in hydrogen into existing gas networks. We need a regulation that is sufficient to enable a hydrogen economy and the political requirement, the political required market ramp up. 
The aim is to completely eliminate specific competitive disadvantages of the use of renewable hydrogen. Gas goes green, or gas infrastructure can be green. Without them, there can be no sufficient decarbonization of industry. By using the existing infrastructure for hydrogen transport and storage, we save time and we save money. Gas networks are central to the implementation of the Energiewende of the energy turnaround. The reg regulatory authorities must now set up the right framework for this. Companies who are going to invest in these expensive technologies have to have a clear and reliable framework at their disposal. Finally, we need an import strategy that will help to meet the future demands. The costs of climate neutral gases will continue considerably to fall and the efficiency of technology will increase. In addition to further technology development, this requires a timely upscaling of plant size, a cost reduction through economy of scales to have a market ramp up. It's very clear to me that in the medium term, we must move away from a pure subsidy way and subsidy regime towards a market framework. Important sectors of the economy, such as steel industry or the chemical industry and the shipping industry, have enormous energy needs. The chemical industry today, um, for them, hydrogen is mainly produced for the production of ammonia and methanol. Hydrogen is usually produced on the basis of natural gas or crude oil. By replacing the hydrogen for the chemical industry alone, CO2 emissions uh, by 10 or 15 million tons can be saved. In order to replace the entire German natural gas demand, about 25 million tons of hydrogen would have to be produced each year. That would require an additional um, 1,200 terawatts of renewable electricity. This is more than twice as much as the German electricity demand is at present. For this reason, reason the hydrogen demand cannot be produced right now just with green electricity from solar and power plants and therefore, the way to a green economy, to green hydrogen, is multicolored. We as West Energy um, are also implementing uh, some interesting projects, the so-called um, Smart Quad. It is the construction in the community of Kaisers Esch, where we try to put out a hydrogen network. The German government supports this by the implementation of real laboratories, real labore. But we get out of the labs, we get into a really um, hydrogen economy, and that's why politics must create the framework for this. Thank you for their attention. Thank you, Katharina. Uh, very interesting insights, and uh, I, will like I would like to come back uh, to the one or the other aspect of your talk uh, in a minute. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that uh, Klaus is back um, in the live stream with us. Ah, there you are. I do hear you. Yes. Good that you are here. Klaus, um, I would... Uh, my first question goes to you, and it's uh, taking reference uh, to uh, one of the key themes of your uh, talk. Um, one of the first sectors where green hydrogen could be used and applied at the earliest as at competitive conditions, as we all know, is the commercial transport sector, trucks, maybe rail and, uh, and, and, and shipping. Once the infrastructure will be there, hydrogen could even be a real alternative for the private transport. Would you say, from your experience in industry and also in politics, that both jumped a little bit too enthusiastically and too early on pure battery electric vehicles, 
or would you see both as kind of a synergetic um, combination? No, battery and fuel cell technologies obviously are complementary one to the other. There is not really a competition between these two. Um, there is a huge complexity when we talk about the electrification of the drivetrain. This is what it boils down to. We need electrified drivetrains for zero emission driving and uh, in the end the power and the energy that goes into the vehicles will have to be based on renewables. And there is uh, a lot of things that battery electric vehicles can do. Um, obviously, starting with smaller vehicles, um, lower range requirements, uh, routine operation where recharging can be uh, factored into the, the operational uh, business. Um, but there are limits to that. And uh, there has always been a huge discussion where the link uh, is where hydrogen and fuel cell actually adds perfectly onto the battery technology. Uh, some do argue, and uh, I'm actually very convinced that that is true, that this is within the passenger car segment. Uh, others would argue that, well, latest when you talk about heavy duty trucking and rails and ships, um, this will not be done by batteries alone. Uh, both batteries and fuel cells will go down in cost, uh, will increase in terms of effic in, in, in efficiency. So uh, it's, you know, a moving, uh, I don't want to say target, but a uh, moving situation that we do have. Um, adding to the complexity is the fact that uh, looking at the automotive sector, autonomous driving, digitalization, all these topics come onto their plate as well. So it is a matter of prioritizing topics. And uh, this is why uh, over the last years, there was a clear focus on battery electric vehicles, uh, also because uh, that is the, in the end, more simpler system to integrate. But I'm very convinced that we will see both technologies complementary one to the other uh, in the whole spectrum of mobility. Thank you very much. That was a very clear statement. Um, Katarina, as a chair of uh, the National Hydrogen Council, you are overlooking the big picture, obviously about uh, where hydrogen at the end of the day can be applied in all the sectors. On the other hand, uh, in your new company, West Energy, one of the most important assets you own are the 24,000 kilometers of gas lines. Um, and uh, also Andreas Feicht a, made a strong point that we cannot afford to waste existing infrastructure. Exactly. But uh, a clear question, is there also a danger that uh, with a very quick uh, run-up of the hydrogen economy, uh, our gas infrastructure will be devaluated, or do you, s do, we, do you see it more as a chance to in even increase the regulated asset base by this conversion? Definitely, we will work on increasing our regulated uh, asset, uh, asset uh, base. Um, you're right, uh, West Energy is an infrastructure supplier and um, we provide infrastructures like uh, electricity uh, grids, um, uh, gas grids, uh, 25,000 um, kilometers um, gas grids um, uh, we have in, in our portfolio. And of course, it is a very important asset uh, to our uh, company. But in a decarbonized world, uh, these grids have to play its own role. That means for us, we have to make our infrastructure fit and to fit in in a um, in future decarbonized uh, energy uh, system. That means we have to um, ramp up, we have to upgrade our natural, uh, natural gas system. That means we try how many um, hydrogen we can uh, feed into the existing gas grid. Uh, we do experiments with biogas. So to which certain extent um, the system can be uh, stable. What we have to invest uh, to even increase uh, the hydrogen amount, what is um, possibly now by 20%. Uh, we have to talk to our local customers and uh, their needs. Uh, we talk to the um, uh, uh, gas uh, device manufacturers. Uh, right now, uh, they can go along with the 20 percent share of hydrogen in the gas grids, so what is uh, possible. And of course, we also uh, start to build pure hydrogen network. So we do both using the existing one, um, uh, try to avoid that it don't get on, uh, out of money. Um, I think that would be really a waste of um, wealth 
uh, and assets we have in this um, economy, but on the same time shifted into a future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would I would really like to ask a more personal question to both of you. Um, traditional careers, as we know them in industry and in politics, in 99% of all the cases, they work in silos. They start in politics or in industry, and they usually progress in the same field. And you both, you are living examples how it could look different. Katarina, you are a chemistrian, yeah? you hold a, d a diploma in, in, in chemistry, but you started in politics and you are now a leader in industry. Klaus, you started at Daimler and now you made your way into politics. Would you say that we are living in such challenging times that we require more cross-border careers uh, to foster more out-of-the-box thinking? Or is it a new archetype of career that you are representing? Who wants to answer first? Klaus, will you start? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you insist. Um, I, I actually do believe in multidisciplinary uh, competencies. Um, we're looking at a very complex picture. We're not only looking at uh, what is technically feasible. We have to take into account what is accepted by the general public, uh, what is financeable. Um, where are we starting at? We usually don't start from scratch when we get uh, innovations uh, into the markets. So we need to consider, um, you know, how do we get buy-in from everybody you need in, in the field? Um, I actually started uh, an academic career uh, at the research center in Jülich, um, then moved on to industry, then uh, well, finally ended up uh, in, in the political arena. And uh, this is really goes all back to uh, 1990s when I personally decided uh, that I want to make a difference in the field of energy and that uh, we need renewable energies in our systems and that we need the right technologies and that we need to shape the framework in order to make this successful. Uh, now, would I have thought at the time that it takes that long? No. Would I have thought at the time that I would end up working at a ministry? Definitely not. Uh, well, here I am today, and I still hope to make a difference. Katarina. Well, I think these, um, the exchange should be become more common in, in Germany. Alone the, this question uh, you raise, uh, what I think was an interesting, important question, shows that we are not used in Germany to these types of career. Uh, in France, in Great Britain, um, in the United States, these changes between serving to the country, going back to um, industry or to business, it's much, much more uh, common. Here in Germany, it's often um, kind of suspicious. I think the two worlds, they demand each other. So the political goals are also uh, only reachable and um, uh, achievable with the support and the strength of economy. On the other hand, we depend on the framework politics sets uh, for us. And it's important to each, uh, understand each other's point. And so going backwards and forwards, I think it increases um, the feeling and sense of the need of the other. Politics has to find broad consensus. We have to um, uh, yeah, kind of lead a, co uh, a company uh, through difficult times. And to work on this understanding, not complain about each other, but talk to each other, exchange minds, exchange experience. I think it's worth to do it. And that's why I hope there will be some more, like uh, we did it. Uh, Andreas Feicht, again, is another example we have um, with these uh, dual or triple careers. Amazing. Uh, let's take this as a programmatic view into the future. Thank you very much, Katharina. Thank you very much, Klaus, for an excellent talk. And I wish you all the success for the future, making the hydrogen world happen. Thank you. <laughs>